Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and even municipal districts. This is the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. Now, we are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet this episode, and I, along with Ian McCormack, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Now, today's episode, we bring you the letter N, which stands for Newfoundland and Labrador. Ian will be sitting out this week's interview, but Craig Pollitt from M is for the Maritimes will be joining me to speak with a mayor on the front lines of municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador. But first, we'll talk about how the Newfoundland and Labrador provincial government recently said no to regionalizational plans for municipalities, how one municipality in British Columbia is be called the most secretive municipality within Canada, and then we'll be talking about how municipalities are being faced with financial constraints in Canada and how the provincial capital of Alberta, Edmonton, is cutting top managers and positions to find savings. But first, Ian, long time no talk. It seem to be that way, Chris. Uh, looking forward to this one. We're ready across the country again from BC to Newfoundland. It is, and we have lots to discuss. So I want to start with Newfoundland and Labrador, where earlier this year, the provincial government decided not to move forward with implementing formal regionalization in Newfoundland and Labrador, rejecting recommendations made in a 2022 report. That report, crafted by Municipalities NL, Professional Administrators NL, and Government Representatives, recommended the creation of approximately 25 regions to administer municipal services. While speaking with reporters in April, the former Municipal and Provincial Affairs Minister in the province said a large geographic area with a low population density means that the approach does not make sense for the province. Ian, when municipalities want to work together, but due to low population, how do municipalities move forward to ensure the sustainability of their community? First of all, Chris, I was a little, I actually would have thought the opposite to be true, that in uh, large geographical areas with lower populations, you'd want to bring several of them together to provide more efficient services over a broader economic uh, area. So in that way, Maybe there's some uh, information or research in the report you um, you mentioned that spoke to that. But right now, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador have one of the lowest average populations for uh, municipal uh, municipalities in the country, and by far the lowest in the the Atlantic region as well. So, it's something that other provinces have done in terms of regionalization of one sort or another. And most recently being New Brunswick, who who had, uh, I think it was 50 new municipalities come into effect you know, on January 1st of this year. Even Nova Scotia doesn't have a lot of municipalities either. Newfoundland has more than double any other Atlantic province. So it's something that the other provinces have, have uh, looked at, dealt with, that I'm a little surprised that Newfoundland has chosen not to proceed with. Are more municipalities across Canada looking at the regionalizational approach? Because we talk about this aspect in Newfoundland and Labrador, but when I speak to municipal leaders from across Canada, they say collaboration is key for a lot of their work because when you're applying for grants, you're not just applying for the wastewater treatment facility in your area. That wastewater treatment facility is going to uh, help other surrounding communities. Is regionalization the way that we're moving in this country? Well, regionalization has been something that's been going on for quite a long time. If you look at things like fire services or uh, solid waste management landfills, the transfer stations, those sort of things have been regionalized uh, on and off throughout the throughout the country and for the last few decades at least. Uh, so I think, yes, regionalization is one way to get to what you need to through regional service commissions. But it's not going the full way towards maximizing efficiency uh, around population growth. So in the mid uh, 2010s, uh, Manitoba went through this process of reducing, significantly reducing its number of municipalities. New Brunswick, as I referenced, has just done that as well. And there are other examples, Ontario too, has which have done this. And those are a little bit different because those are political uh, political amalgamations or political regionalization 
up to find some sort of um, a critical mass of population that where it makes sense to provide efficient services to a group of people. Other provinces, Saskatchewan, Alberta, haven't really gone that direction, at least not yet. And they have gone the way of regional service commissions, however. So, yeah, regionalization is one way. Uh, amalgamations are another, whether it's enforced by the province or territory or whether it's the the uh, populations or the, the regional governments uh, deciding to do it themselves. And I was, I was running some numbers here, too. I was telling you a little bit earlier off air, uh, too, Chris, about how many pop people are in each municipality in Atlantic Canada. And so Nova Scotia has the most people per capita, obviously, the most people per municipality at nearly 20,000 people in each municipality. They only have 49 in the whole province. And next beyond that is New Brunswick, which recently went through that significant amalgamation process. They have 104 municipalities and so about 7,400 people per. And PEI is next with 59 municipalities and 2,600 people, which makes sense because it's a relatively, it's a very small province. And bringing up the rear on that is Newfoundland, which has the most municipalities, more than double any other one with 278, which gives you that average population of 1,800, 1,900 people per municipality. So if you're looking at efficiency in service delivery or programs or in the government structure, it's certainly not being found when you have a government for 1,800 people versus Nova Scotia with a government for 19, 20,000 people. So there certainly is something going on there in Newfoundland that's created a, a difference in opinion versus what happens in the other Atlantic Canadian provinces. Now we're about to head to British Columbia, where the city of Prince George has been selected as the municipal winner. I'm not sure if they would want to be called the winner of this award of the 2022 Code of Silence Award for Outstanding Achievement in Government Secrecy. The award highlights the city's repeated and devastating failures to effectively conduct the public's business in public by transparently sharing information about how taxpayer dollars are spent on city projects and operations. According to Brent Jolly, the president of the Canadian Association of Journalists, or CAG, there is a clear pattern of behavior in Prince George that cannot be allowed to fester any longer. Now, I'm not on the front lines of Prince George. But how should municipalities consider transparency when working on issues of the public matter? There's a couple of things to consider here, uh, Chris. The first is legally, uh, that there are there is freedom of information and protection of privacy legislation in every province and territory. So certainly there are some things which must be discussed behind closed doors, even if decisions are made in public. Things like negotiating a contract, for example, which might come into play here. So that's one part. The other then is... The municipalities and particularly the council's perception on what transparency really means. Now, the legislation, the, the provincial legislation and the federal stuff, for that matter, uh, is gives you the, the ability to do everything in public except that which you can't legally do in public. The other end of that spectrum is to do everything behind closed doors, except that stuff you must do in public. So somewhere on that continuum, every municipality falls. In this case, what's going on with Prince George seems to be more towards the it's easier to make a decision or to have that debate enclosed uh, rather than in open, which would get down to communication too. Now, I've had the opportunity to work with the last two councils in Prince George over the last five or six years, I think. This surprises me a little bit. And looking back at some of the information in this article, some of it refers back to, I think, 2017. So going back six years or so when different council, different administration, all sorts of things. So this might be catching up on some of the things that have had happened in the past, but there is certainly culture that comes into this. So even if a new mayor, a new council, a new city manager comes into office, they're still dealing with the previous administration's culture. And even if they want to change it, it's you're changing a ship in midstream and it's going to take some energy and some effort. That said, being named to this, you said this is, are they really the winner? Well, probably I would not use the term winner much like you wouldn't either because it isn't something you really want to be known for, for sure. Elsewhere in Canada, 
the city of Edmonton has eliminated several high-profile leadership positions in an organizational shakeup at City Hall that cuts two departments while adding new management jobs. The city manager's office announced a suite of changes Wednesday as part of restructuring efforts to find $60 million in savings and reallocate $240 million over four years to areas that are a priority for the city council. Ian, now I've worked with many municipal politicians. I've spoken with many municipal politicians. And one of the politicians stands out in particular who said that when it came to matter of personnel in the budget, particularly in smaller communities, one can't have feelings when making personnel decisions. They went on to say when it comes to the budget, each person in the organization is just a title and not a person. Is that the best way to look at decision when it comes to personnel when trying to find cost-saving measures in an organization as large as Edmonton, but even as small as a village? It certainly can be, I suppose. When I do orientations or speak to new elected officials about various topics, one of the things I often talk about is different types of leadership decision-making. And I say, you know, when you're an executive, CAO, for example, city manager in this case, you need to think about role rather than person. What are the pieces that I need to pull together in order to make this organization work as well as it possibly can? And if you have incumbents who have those uh, those aptitudes, fantastic. And if you don't and you think you can find them elsewhere, then you replace them. And so that's maybe what's happened in, in this case and other cases like it. However, when you are now second, third, fourth level manager in some large organizations, you're often provided with the people and you have to make them fit someplace well and work towards their own aptitudes. And to me, that's kind of leadership or management decision making versus executive decision making like you'd see with the city manager in this case. I also think this is telegraphing something to the city of Edmonton by saying we don't need as many deputy city managers, some of whom I know, by the way, we don't need as many of these people. But we are going to therefore have to streamline elsewhere, too, because if you're looking for you, I think you had said 60 million dollars in cuts, you're not going to find that alone by reducing the, the, the ranks of the managers who are here, that the front line, the people who are uh, moving the snow in the winter, cutting the grass in the summer, who are providing programs and services, those people are the ones who are the highest value to the people who are actually receiving. So somewhere between that front edge, the greater blade. And the city manager, where are you going to find that 60 million? And you better start finding it at the top before you start asking to find it somewhere else. Is it easier to cut services than personnel? Depends on the. Uh, so I'm not an HR person, but my take on it would be that it would depend like on. Like you've the worked with municipalities. You Sorry. Oh, yeah. but you've worked with municipalities across this country. And I'm assuming they've had this issue as well, where you have to find serve, you have to find efficiencies, but you also have to find savings. And every municipal counselor that I've chatted to, and I'm assuming you as well, always say we don't want to cut services because our residents will notice that. Yeah. If you don't cut services, you don't like raising taxes. How do you find efficiencies? It's, oh, that's right. You have to cut personnel, which then affects service levels. Are municipalities in a lose-lose situation here? I think they are in some ways. And so those people, the people who are paying the freight, the property tax payers, are the ones who ultimately get to call the shots at election time to decide <laughs> whether they're more interested in paying a lower tax bill whether they're more interested in getting more enhanced services. And in some cases with inflation, even just keeping current service levels can be quite challenging too. And the people that end up getting cut at some point are the ones who are delivering the front lines because that's where most of the staff happen to be. It's also where the lowest salaries are. So there's a little bit of a, an incongru incongruity there too. The, the I, I think it's really difficult to do because a council ultimately has very few levers it can pull. One of the one of which is budget. So what they're suggesting is to what they suggest to sit to management is this is what we think is tolerable in terms of a price hike for your property taxes in a year, and then we're also setting service levels. And at some place those two things have to meet, and they it's a real stretch to figure where they're supposed to meet and pile onto this downloading, where 
Citizens require services regardless of which order of government is doing it. And if the federal and provincial or territorial are doing something that is demanded, then the municipality has to look after it as well. And if it doesn't, it looks like the municipality that's creating a gap that in reality, they're not responsible for. You recently attended a conference for municipal administrators here in Alberta, in Canmore. And I, I, I'm going to have the pleasure of sitting down with the Manitoba Municipal uh, Administrator Association uh, president later on this week. Are municipal administrators, are the municipal frontline staff feeling burnt out? Because I think that's a little big question that we have to ask ourselves, because while the municipalities are being asked to do more with less from the province and the federal government, administration is being asked to do even more with less because the city council has to divvy up the less that they get from the provincial and federal governments. Are municipal administrators feeling burnt out? I think they are. I think they are. I think the frontline people in a lot of ways are because not only are they dealing with the things you've just referenced, they're dealing with natural disasters, let's say. So a lot of people are dealing with water, too much or too little water. We're dealing with floods. We've just come out of a huge uh, bout with COVID. And I, in speaking with municipal administrators, particularly the, the senior ones, they're feeling they, the punches just keep on coming. So they are burned out. They're finding that in their staff. They're also seeing who's going to come in after me. Like the, the ranks of really good young up and coming energetic enthusiastic caos are is pretty thin and i think that there's some stress and tension that's coming from that way as well it's a great time for a person to go into a career as a local government manager across this country because succession planning is is a big point both for the the elected officials who's going to replace the elected officials now of course you can't appoint your replacement but hopefully you can cultivate a crop of people who can can potentially could and you could say the same thing about administrators too part of their job is re is replacing themselves when they're done we're just not seeing a whole lot of people coming up behind so yeah they're burned out so i, I thank you for answering that question but we're, we're going to be taking a quick break and we'll be back with our interview with the town of dover newfoundland and labrador mayor tony r keats we'll be right back Welcome to N is for Newfoundland and Labrador on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Today, we are honored to have Mayor Tony Keats of Dover, Newfoundland and Labrador on the show. First elected in 1996, Mayor Keats has played an integral part in the municipal landscape in the province. He has served as president of municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as sitting on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Earlier this year, though, he was announced as one of the three Canadian mayors in the running to be the world's mayor of 2023. Today, we are going to be chatting about the state of municipalities in the province. So, Mayor Keats, Tony, welcome to the Political Trenches. And let's get this chat underway with my first question. In your opinion, Tony, what is the state of municipalities like in Newfoundland and Labrador today? Uh, one word, challenging probably at times. Um, you know, I, I, I've been on council now for 31 years. This is my 31st year. I think when I got on council, I figured, well, I do a term or two and that'd be it. But uh, I just, I, I, I like being in municipalities. I like being on the ground. I like talking to people. Um, that's one of the big things. So I served as a councillor for the first four years. Then I went to and took the mayor's chair in, um, in uh, 1996, like you said. Uh, but very challenging. Um, you know, uh, I know I heard Craig in the past on, on your podcast and, and other uh, elected officials talk about, uh, you know, the state of municipal politics and, and, and where we lie within, within the realm of, uh, you know, politics in, you know, the three levels in Canada. And uh, uh, it's pretty sad uh, when we come to, you know, infrastructure funding and, and making sure that we're heard at, around the table, making sure we're, we're at the table, to be honest with you. That was one of the big things, I think, when I was president of MNL was, was trying to get the uh, provincial and federal governments to uh, focus on that and make sure that, you know, we're at the table, especially when we're being talked about or if there's an announcement coming down uh, the line. So, uh, so challenging is one of the big words. Uh, sorry about that. So challenging is one of the big words I think I would use. Uh, rewarding at times is, is another one that I would use personally, to, to be honest with you. Tony, 
I'd, I'd like to follow up on the comment about seat at the table because I know it's it's a big deal in the municipal world. Uh, it, it's expressed in different ways in parts of the country, but essentially what we're talking about, what you mentioned, is so many conversations happen within the provincial government, mm -hmm. uh, with between, between departments in the provincial government, or between the provincial government and the federal government about municipalities without municipalities actually sitting in on that conversation. Yeah. And I, I can remember a uh, big infrastructure funding announcement happened in the city of St. John's, a federal provincial agreement, 10 year agreement. It was hundreds of millions of dollars for the province. Yeah. Municipalities found out the content of that agreement after the announcement. Yeah. I remember the, the mayor of St. John's was the MC for the announcement. They'd asked the mayor to MC the announcement. Nobody in the municipal sector knew anything about what was in that agreement, even though it essentially dictated how they were going to spend their infrastructure money, your infrastructure money, yeah. for the next 10 years. Is that, I'm assuming that's still a thing. And from a, your perspective as the mayor of a small municipality, a rural municipality in the province, mm -hmm. That's got to be a bit of a pain, isn't it? Just this is not a theoretical issue. This is a day to day. It makes it hard to do our work issue. Yeah, it, you know, it comes down like like you said earlier. I know when I was president of MNL and and, and uh, you know when you were the CEO of, of uh, MNL, we we struggled with that. Uh, you know, we've often had calls from uh, the federal government saying that you know we like for you to be in attendance to this announcement, and we only know that day. What the announcement was going to be and, and we show up shake hands and you know say thank you for the money uh but we wouldn't at the table to say okay this is okay or or where should the money go to is that the right place for her to put the money uh you know is that the much needed uh infrastructure that we need to replace or fix within our municipalities because sometimes it's not we know yeah. what's crucial within our municipalities uh and sometimes you know when we do up the infrastructure uh you know the agenda what we want done you know, we look at roads, we look at wastewater, we look at, you know, new water, we look at clean drinking water or, or other things. And we prior, prioritize them, you know, in a way. But if it's not what, you know, the federal or provincial government is looking at, sometimes we get monies that's focused somewhere else that's not focused in the areas that we really need it to be focused on. So it hurts. It really do hurt because, you know, we're the ones that's on the ground. We're the ones that's, you know, trying to make the best out of a situation but in our municipalities with, you know, our hands tied to be on our back sometimes. You and I have lived through a lot of discussions on regionalization in the municipal sector. It's not just a municipal issue. Regionalization of public services is happening right across the board, healthcare, education, you name it. If, if, if governments are involved, regionalization is part of the conversation. Yeah. But on the municipal side of things, um, the provincial government with MNL, uh, over a course of a couple of years on a uh, sort of a task force on regionalization and where it might go. Recommendations were made about a new structure, a new path. And they've recently come out, I think about a year later, a little over a year later, and said, yeah, we just don't think this is feasible. Sure. Uh, without, well, I was going to make a statement, but I'll ask you. If they're not going to do something like is in that report, is do you see an answer out there right now given where the province is going small p province given where the province of newfoundland labrador is going on demographics a bunch of things mm -hmm. do you feel like the province has a viable path forward around regionalization in the municipal sector at this point no i really don't to be honest with you I, like you know when i was talking to the minister at the time uh, you know she explained to me why they couldn't go forward uh uh, with the, uh, you know, with the report and going forward on regionalization. Um, I, un I understand completely where she's coming from. I really, really do. Uh, but, you know, we do need some form of regionalization. Uh, and it's not going to work if we don't bring in, you know, the unincorporated areas, the, you know, LSDs, the local service districts. And, and they're a real majority now when it comes to uh, the numbers, but not to the numbers in the effect of, you know, our municipalities who are incorporated, because, you know, I think I think we got like 90 percent of our population are, you know, living and working and doing everything within those uh, uh, municipalities that's incorporated and paying taxes and and doing their daily things. Uh, the incorporated makes up the other 10 percent. Uh, so if we don't bring those within 
some kind of regional system. Uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be hard to do. But I think they're more relying on us to do the work again. It, it's being ended to us, you know, like, like uh, air in my area, we got nine communities that's, that's drawing off each other, uh, you know, that just started our, our, uh, our joint councils again in our area. Uh, you know, I know that we can work together. Uh, we need funding to do that. Um, and what are we looking for? You know, we're looking for bylaw enforcers, you know, some kind of enforcement kind of thing. We're looking at water analysis uh, uh, people. We're look that, that kind of stuff. That's what we're looking for. And if government don't come across and say, yeah, that's, that's a, a, you know, a, a, a logical thing that you do need, you know, this is what we're going to try. Even if we try some kind of pilot project just to see if that would work for our area, because every area in, in, in our province might need the same things that we need. Uh, you know, right. and that's where we got to come from is, you know, one thing, I think one, one regional kind of government is not going to work in other parts of our province because we're so sparse. Uh, you know, what, what works in other provinces uh, probably won't work here because of our logistics and, and where we live to, right? And I'm, gonna I, jump, I'm gonna jump in here for one second because I want to ask this really important question. I'm about to uh, mention a word that is the most dirtiest word in municipalities across <laughs> Canada, and that is amalgamation. Yeah, you we don't use that word no more. <laughs> you may not use it, but people do. Are municipalities needing to potentially look at this option in in Newfoundland and Labrador now that the province has said no to regionalization? Or is that word even more dirty in Newfoundland and Labrador when it comes to municipalities? Because I know some municipalities here in Alberta won't even, like, if the word is uttered in a uh, inter-municipal inter, uh, meeting, the meeting stops and people go to their different rooms and it just doesn't happen. Does Is amalgamation a bad word and our municipalities need to look that way in the province? Yeah, Chris, I, you know, it is a real bad word, to be honest with you. It, it, it comes back to, you know, a forced amalgamation that was done years ago by the French government. And, and uh, you know, how it plays out within municipalities, You're, you know, because you often have little small municipalities that are around each other who got conflicts sometimes with each other, might be silly conflicts, might have been, you know, inherited conflicts from from years and from, you know, great, great grandfathers. Right. Uh, but uh, it, it's something that we need to look at. But I think we need to look at it personally, to be honest with you, as you know, like I said just a minute ago, you know, the nine communities around me, we can look at stuff. But do we need to join together? as as one to to accomplish what needs to be done or can we do it within that regional system within our communities and and i think that's what we're looking at right now is the need and the want uh you know we got a lot of towns that's really struggling now when it comes to finances when it comes to getting employees and you know we, we got town managers that's only working probably half days or a couple of days a week uh you know operating communities uh, we got counselors out there that's that's you know doing maintenance on 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 the roads and then uh, you know potholes and on their equipment. So you know when you look at all that kind of stuff, you know maybe you do need to come them together. Maybe you do need to put you know your differences aside and say what's better for my community and what's better for my residents. And that's really where we need to be as you know community citizens, as people who who sit that, around that table. We need to make those you know hard decisions, but we need to make them and make sure they're in the, in the benefit of our communities. So Tony, one of the, um, one of the things that dictates what you can and can't do around those kinds of decisions, because I think you're right, there's a lot of municipalities who, a lot of municipal leaders who see the point of doing more together and <laughs> trying, trying new things. Um, and just like everywhere else in the country, municipalities, mm -hmm exist at the pleasure of the provincial government. Exactly. They exist under a, a legislative regime that dictates what they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And the legislation in Newfoundland and Labrador, I think now that New Brunswick and PEI have gotten new legislation in the last number of years, I think we officially have the oldest municipal legislation in the country uh, back to 1999, I believe it is. Yeah. So, and that legislation was based on old legislation that wasn't sort of sparkly new futuristic legislation that's right we've been talking about new enabling legislation in the province for five years now something like that well, it's, yeah it's a long time i think it was a i think the report uh you know uh i think it was uh what we heard report went into the provincial government around november of 2018 i do believe 
Uh, yeah. it's, it's it's been lying around those departments, and and I know you know that they have been struggling to you know put together some form of new enabling legislation and uh, one that we need uh, to move communities forward. To be honest with you, because you know we can only we can only work inside of like you said the 1999 one, which is so which is so. Uh, uh, prescriptive, to be honest with you, right? It's, it's we got our hands tied with the inside of that one, you know. Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's something that, that we need to look at. I know when I was talking to the minister, the, the previous minister, you know, she did say that they're hoping to get something out by the end of this year, uh, you know. We, but we're I don't I don't think we're holding them to it enough, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, mm. we need to get them more, and I think that's that's where we're falling down as municipalities is that we need to make sure that they hear us and. Uh, so that they can get it done, right? Because they haven't been hearing us, or we haven't been saying it enough for them to hear us, to be honest with you. I want to talk about resources now. And there's two areas of discussion that I want to talk about here, because one I didn't even think about until Craig told me in our pre-meeting before this interview happened. I want to talk about finances, and he's going to talk about the human resource aspect of what's mm-hmm. going on in the province. Now, as I said, I, I had the pleasure of listening to your conversation with Scott Pierce, the president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, on your show, The Chambers, which is available via Spotify. The links will be in the show notes of all our uh, episodes as well. And you talked about how municipalities need a new fiscal framework. What do municipalities want from the provincial and federal government when it comes to this new framework? And I know you're speaking as the past president, you're speaking as a mayor, but what type of new framework are you looking for from the provincial government to even start the conversation around a new method of delivery of service and finances? Yeah, you know, Chris, what what I see, I think what Scott was trying to say too, you know, in my podcast and and what we said uh, before the podcast is that, you know, we see a fiscal framework uh, being plotted out as, you know, a, a guide, something that we need to see when it comes to, you know, when we apply for funding, what we do when in our municipalities, like I said before, uh, when it comes to, you know, finances and, 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 and the framework of making sure that what's done in our communities is done right. Uh, you know, I know as we said over the years, especially when it comes to climate change now, uh, you know, we were, we're looking at government putting putting things back like culverins and road work and and bridges. What they're pushing, they're trying to put back the same thing that was always there, which is not it's, it's not right. It's, you know, like Scott said, we need to build better and building better means, you know, we need that bigger culvert or we need that that bigger road or we need our, our arbor stone or armor stone to put on sides of the road so that we're not being washed out. You know, we're not getting that storm, that thousand or hundred year storm. That we're getting now every probably every i don't know every year every two years uh so you know that's the kind of stuff we're looking at especially when it comes to i don't know the municipal f- fiscal framework is you know we want to make sure that things are there so that we can access and we can access it earlier and better and easier and i think if i could jump in just and tony maybe you can comment um as one ex- one example one real life example of how lack of resources has an absolutely immense impact. And when we talk about lack of resources, basically we're talking about, you know, municipalities only have property tax to draw on, to raise revenue. Property tax, God love it's been around forever, but doesn't really follow the economy very well. There's a bunch of issues with it. But in Newfoundland and Labrador, there was a very specific issue around wastewater Mm -hmm. and new regulations that came down from the federal government to establish new requirements for wastewater treatment in the province close to a billion dollars, I think, was the last estimate I saw to do all the work that needed to be done. Yeah. And if that work was not done properly, the regulations were saying things like, well, the town manager or the town clerk as the owner of the system will have to go to jail sure. or will be uh, ha- have to pay fines in excess of $5 million. Now, MNL did some good work along with FCM to try to forestall some of that. Mm-hmm. But those regs are there and there's still close to 100 municipalities who i think it's safe to say are sort of scratching their heads thinking where are we going to get this money we yeah. you know we might you just because you've got until 2040 to do something doesn't mean much if you're never going to have the money to do it that's right so that's is, right is that still a thing that's churning forget the pun forgive the pun uh in the municipal sector yeah it, it it's a it's a big topic i know i went on uh the, the local 
Grado talk show there a couple of weeks ago and talked about, you know, uh, wastewater within our province and, and the problems that we're finding, especially, like I said earlier, in the nine municipalities that, that you know, that's in my area in, 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 uh, in the province are struggling with. And, and that comes to, you know, we're doing monitoring, uh, monitoring off the, the, the wastewater flows. And, you know, we, we pay uh, to have that monitored, uh, you know, 10000 to $12,000 a year per wa uh, waste uh, station or, or, or uh, a flow station, right, outfall. Uh, you know, we got some municipalities that's paying up to sixty dollars or $90,000 a year just for that. When we can be taking those, those dollars, putting them aside to fix the problem, not to monitor the problem, that we know there is a problem. Uh, you know, we, we were told that we should be doing it for a year. We're still doing it. We're still monitoring. And as you said, yeah. you know, we had enforcement officers. Enforcement officers visited my community and Tritton, my manager. You know, our manager at our, at our town office, you know, that was, that was a, a big news article for, for that week, right? Uh, you know, comes in with guns on their side and making sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, very intimidating, uh, you know, but having that money, and we know we, we need to fix that system. Uh, but, you know, I don't think that's one way that we're going to be able to accomplish that is when we're throwing a good money for, for, for bad, to be honest with you, right? Uh, but it's something yeah. that we need to fix. We know, we know that, you know, like we had that, we had that emergency wastewater uh, 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 meeting in St. John's that time, you know, and, and everybody showed up. And we had all five minister, all five members of, of the, the, the federal government from Newfoundland show up and take questions. Uh, you know, it's something that we got because we're looking at, the authorization and making sure that we get the uh, the authorization because we didn't we you know we lost we, we were in that gap that time right I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say we're running out of counselors yeah and, and probably running out of staff i mean staff turnover in the province for municipal staff is something like 30 percent per year so are you seeing this play or how are you seeing this play out i guess in your council neighboring councils around the province is this something that worries you yeah it, it do you know when we're coming through you know we have municipal elections every four years and, and i think every year it looks a little difficult for to get people to run for municipal office and, and one of the big reasons why is because the amount of work that you got to do and and uh, you know you don't receive any kind of funding you don't receive any kind of you know thanks on the back kind of stuff and they know that and, and why would you want to give up your time and serve on a council uh to do better in your community when uh, you know you're 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 confronted with that kind of that kind of uh, you know episodes on a day to day basis or, or or weekly basis to be honest with you you know uh, some of us can take it because you know we got thicker skin or, or or we've been in the system long enough that we we understand and we know and we know what uh, we can treat the system but you know even managers take on so much you know and, and people come to the office or call uh, you know our town staff or you know especially the maintenance that's outside even put up with some kind of you know things from from municipalities or from our residents in our municipalities and we got a in in our town like every other town now we got you know we we, we don't put up with that you know we we got a no you know no uh, conduct kind of thing you know you don't you can't do that uh, we're notified of the police we're set charges and and that's what we need to do and and now that the government came down with the uh with the or you know the, the conflict of order uh conflict of interest and and the order uh conduct order oh, the conduct yeah, code of conduct is uh, it, it's what's needed. But we need to make sure that, you know, municipal officials and, 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 and counselors need to take those kind of courses and, and, and they need to know, you know, what consequences is out there if you if you do this. And, and not only with code of conduct, but we need it with almost everything that we do, to be honest with you. The role of the municipality has changed a lot over the last 30 years since you first were elected. Uh, now municipalities are being asked to do more with less. There's a lot of downloading that's been happening across this country and across these provinces. How much has the job changed from when you first were elected uh, mayor in 1996 to now in 2023? And do you see it evolving even more into a more uh, regionalized, provincialized uh, mayoralship because the issues you're facing today are now more provincially mandated, whether it be healthcare, education, infrastructure funding, compared to what you were probably dealing with when you were first elected? Yeah. Well, Chris, you know, when I got on council back in 1992, I showed up to probably two meetings a month. Uh, no prior prep work, you know, no committee work before that. 
uh, now I deal with my municipality and probably some around me on a day-to-day basis, every day. If I'm not using my phone, if I'm not texting or if I'm not answering emails, it's in person or on the phone. Uh, you know, my my uh, uh, nine to five job that I do or eight to five job that I do, uh, even in that job, I'm, I'm dealing with the public uh, municipal issues because they see me, they know, you know, where I'm to, I'm very accessible. So I'm dealing with something on the municipal, you know, municipal frame all the time. It's, it's not a, a bi-weekly meeting anymore. It's, it's every day, you know, we, we do prior committee stuff. We do proposals, uh, you know, my ends are pretty well into everything that happens at our community. And I, I don't know if I would want it any different because I'm used to that now. And I, and, and I'm that kind of person. I always need something to do. Uh, but, you know, like like we said earlier, it, it's a burnout issue for some some officials or, or some municipal elected officials. Right. Uh, it's 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 it, I can see it being a burnout issue for a lot, and especially coming on. If you're new, you really you're not prepared for it. And that's why I always said that, you know, you should have some kind of course. You should have some uh, some kind of class before you put your name forward just to know what you're getting involved with so that you know that you can stick around to to do that job that needs to be done. Tony, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Craig and I have learned a lot, and hopefully our viewers and our listeners have also learned a lot in our interview about the stats, the, the sort of the status of what's going on in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and also municipalities in the province. So thank you so much for doing this. No problem, Chris. I, I appreciate you reaching out and, and Craig reaching out. Uh, I'd like to wish you both the very best, and uh, I look forward to uh, chatting again. Thanks very much, Tony. So just a reminder that our full interview will be with Tony will be airing next Wednesday and we'll be right back after this quick break. Well, Ian, another great episode. N is for Newfoundland and Labrador. I want to thank Craig and I want to thank Tony for coming in and sitting down and talking about the issues that are going on in Newfoundland and Labrador. How do you think about the episode? There's nothing like lived experience to actually provide a really entertaining show. I think it, it, the interview, along with our conversation about some of the things like regionalization, say, in Newfoundland and Labrador, I think really bookends this whole thing really nicely. So what's on the agenda for you over the next few months? Because we have one last episode before we go on our summer hiatus. But what's 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 on the agenda for Ian over the next two weeks? Two weeks? Well, I actually will be on vacation myself for a little bit of that time, going to uh, visit family on Vancouver Island, which will be really quite nice. We, uh, Strategic Steps, will spend a bunch of the summer uh, working with uh, working with Craig and others to incorporate our uh, Atlantic office really into the corporate structure so that we can provide val- the same kind of value in those provinces as we do out west. Oh, that's awesome. And for us, we're just going to be slowing down here because we've recorded our 602nd episode of the Cross Border Interview. So we'll look forward to that. And then we're going to be heading out after uh, August 1st. We're heading back to Ontario, visit some of these great communities that have we come on the show. So look forward to seeing some of these communities up close and personal and meeting some of these yeah. counselors in person, which is such a weird experience for me because I'm used to seeing them via Zoom. <laughs> Sure, you'll be able to collect some pins and they'll all look at you and say, you're taller than I thought you were. Exactly. Um, So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. If you can, hit the subscribe button, follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and leave us a star rating. Leave us a rating. It does help the algorithm and it does help us get the word out. And then share this with your uh, municipal-minded friends as well, because it's always great when more people give feedback. Uh, So until next time. Ian, always a pleasure. Indeed, Chris, you too. We'll see you later.